Hinduism is the world's oldest living religion, and it won't be disappearing anytime soon. This ancient worldview currently boasts over 1 billion devotees, making it the third most popular religion in the world. Despite its popularity, scholarship in philosophy of religion continues to ignore its influence, with academic papers on the Abrahamic faiths vastly outnumbering those devoted to Hinduism. Our classrooms don't paint a prettier picture. In UK schools, Hinduism is scarcely taught in comparison to the other major world religions, with reports showing that educators lack the confidence and subject knowledge to teach Hinduism properly. Fortunately, thanks to the work of scholars such as Jessica Fraser, things are changing. Jessica Fraser is a lecturer in theology and religion at Trinity College, Oxford, and fellow of the Oxford Centre for Hindu Studies. Fraser is one of the world's leading experts on Hindu philosophy, reshaping and globalising philosophy of religion for the 21st century. As well as being the founding editor of the Journal of Hindu Studies, she is best known for her books Reality, Religion and Passion, The Bloomsbury Companion to Hindu Studies, and most recently, Hindu Worldviews, Theories of Self, Ritual and Reality. Far from your ivory tower academic, Jessica is a committed public philosopher, broadening the horizons of academics and the general public through her captivating writing style and regular media appearances. As we shall see, Fraser's work demonstrates Hinduism's rich and insightful philosophical tradition, a tradition that can shed light on life's greatest questions, from the nature of life, God and suffering, to the fundamental structure of reality. Hello and welcome to episode 93 of the Pan Sidecast. I'm the cosmic fluid in depths unfathomed Mr. Jack Symes. I'm joined once again by the cosmic egg that is Mr. Ollie Marley. Hello. Speech is her abode and space her foundation. It's Dr. Jessica Frazier. <laughs> Hi. We had a huge cosmic coincidence before a recording, something we haven't mentioned already. When I was emailing you and inviting you onto the show and, and reading your book. I said to Ollie, I've got a brilliant guest lined up for the Global Philosophy of Religion Project, Jessica Frazier. And Ollie said, Jessica Frazier, she was my dissertation supervisor a long time ago. When was this? So this was what so I graduated in 2011, I think, from the University of Kent when I did religious studies there. And you were my dissertation supervisor when I was there, which was just a very strange cosmic coincidence. But it's pretty strange. It's lovely to have you on the show to talk about Hinduism with us today. What did you do, Ollie? I don't remember the topic. So this is going to make me sound way cooler than I actually am. So I did my dissertation on the relationship between Buddhism and Chinese martial arts. Oh, yeah, um, I remember yeah. that one. That was amazing. Yeah, it was a brilliant to write, really good fun. We had some really wonderful students doing fabulous topics at that time, really interesting combinations between Asian thought and broader theoretical issues and bigger questions. That was great, yeah. You must have done something seriously wrong in a past life, Jessica, to uh, have, have Holly <laughs> popping back up again. In all seriousness, it's, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Before we jump in, in addition to thanking Westhill Endowment and all of our patrons for supporting the show, we'd like to say a big thank you to the Global Philosophy of Religion Project for making this episode possible. The Global Philosophy of Religion Project at the University of Birmingham is generously funded by the John Templeton Foundation and led by the brilliant Professor Eugene Nagasawa. As part of our partnership, we'll be bringing you five very special interviews on philosophy of religion, each one focusing on a different world religion, the goal of which being to inspire and diversify new conversations in the philosophy of religion. To find out more about the project, you can go to www.global-philosophy.org or hit the link in the iTunes description. So, Jessica, the first question we ask all of our guests, a nice and easy one to start, what is philosophy? <laughs> Ridiculously, I didn't see that coming. As someone who's worked on philosophy across multiple traditions and is interested in how it arises very differently across cultures, I think philosophy isn't any one thing. When you look at epistemology, when you look at aesthetics, etc., they really often have quite different methods and goals. But just from a kind of a genetic perspective, the genesis of it, it seems that it's the moment when people need to know the hidden structures of things. You get empirically based cosmologies turning up in ancient philosophy, you know, ancient literatures around the world for a long, long time. But there's this turning point when they start to say, okay, what are the causal structures? How do things hang together? What is inherent? What are the grounding structures, the levels at which we can see the universe divided into, in a sense, strata? What is the hierarchy that is there? What are the different kinds of things? And very quickly, I think they often will then go to questions about 
what is the difference between the substance and the property? What is the status of consciousness entities or indeed of kind of semantic entities? You know, what are universals? And so all that hidden world for which you need special tools like inference start to go into action at a certain point when I think philosophy begins. In India, when that happens, they see it as almost magical. Inference is almost like a visionary magical tool. And the hidden world gives you extraordinary power to see deeper into reality. So there's something lovely about the idea that philosophers are these visionary magicians, that every undergraduate is doing the magical stuff that the ancient world was interested in. And that leads really nicely into our next question, Jessica. We're mainly going to be discussing Eastern philosophy today. And your work is rare because you clearly have a familiarity with both Eastern and Western traditions. Are there any big general differences between the ways these two different traditions see the purpose of philosophy? It's often said that Indian philosophies particularly are interested overall in soteriology, right? They're interested in some kind of ultimate goal of well-being for the human. That was in the past that people tended to assume that was always going to be about escape from the world, escape from suffering into some sort of higher state. And there's something to be said for that. But I'm not sure that that's really different from the West. Plato is also interested in soteriology. And with soteriology as escape and transformation of the human person into some higher form of some kind, whether it's just soul or whether it's just a universalized, improved version, also comes the issue of well-being. So I think to say that Plato and Aristotle aren't interested in this broader beneficial side of philosophy but that India is, is maybe wrong, is maybe unhelpful. I think that they all see it both as something that's aimed at the ultimate improvement of the human and also as something that has its own innate power and insight, both practically useful and also kind of fascinating in itself. I think every tradition at some point hits a space where they just think, wow, an atomistic view, India's <laughs> word for wonder, abhuta, this amazement. I think that comes in quite early, actually. As you know, studying the Eastern philosophy is quite rare in Western Europe and philosophy departments. Very few philosophy of religion courses will include any of the Eastern philosophies. They're all the Abrahamic God, you see that phrase over and over again, the Christian God, the God of Judaism, the God of Islam. In your book, Hindu Worldviews, a nice quote from you here, you say, Understandings of India are too often overwritten by ideas of reason taken from ancient Greece, the biblical heritage, and the European Enlightenment. But how did you come to break this mould? You were brought up in, I believe, the USA and in the UK. And I imagine that these Abrahamic religions dominated your sphere of learning as well. So how did you come to get out of this Western-centered tradition? That's a good question. To be honest, thinking of my history, the idea that we all start with a certain tradition orientation that we're brought up in, and that's what interests us, and maybe we break out of that room. Maybe even that is wrong. My family are from Washington, D.C., standard middle-class Washington, D.C. family. But we always had, if I looked on the shelf, we'd have Hermann Hesse's Siddhartha, certain kind of literatures that were popular in the 60s and even back in the 50s and even back in the 20s, Jung, a whole range of thinkers. And of course, the American transcendentalists, if you're interested in Whitman, if you've got Thoreau or Emerson on the shelf, all this stuff was already part of a culture, American totally middle-class culture, that was fascinated by other ways of thinking. My grandmother was wonderful. She always was just immediately, you would say, oh, I wonder what they think about this in, I don't know, whichever other culture. And it was kind of assumed that there are other ways of thinking that are going to be useful tools for you in life. So that from that bookshelf and from that family fascination. And Washington, of course, has these galleries and museums, and they're all free for everybody. You know, teenagers can cut school and just hang out in the National Gallery so that you're always being presented with a wide global resource. And for me, that was a big part of it. Later, when I wanted to do philosophy as a degree, there were elements of analytic philosophy that, you know, metaphysics isn't always in trend. Ontology is not always in trend. India had ideas that I just thought were utterly fascinating. So going that direction seemed right. Many philosophers and academics have intellectual heroes, Jessica, who encourage them to take the first steps on their academic journey. From our previous guests, Pat Churchton said Francis Crick, Philip Goff said Descartes, Stephen Mumford said Socrates, Lisa Whiting said Mary Warnock and her sixth form teachers, Kate Mann and Rebecca Buxton said hashtag no heroes. Is there anyone who you would consider to be an intellectual hero, perhaps someone who has inspired your passion? 
Oh, I can totally believe in heroes. I think they're great. We need lots of Indiana Joneses or whatever of the intellectual mm-hmm. world. I can give you a bunch. That's the only, but it's more like an Avengers Assemble. Once you read Spinoza, if you're into it, you catch it and you're like, oh my God, this is amazing. And that, of course, always is going to take you closer to India because there are a lot of common concerns, though they're obviously not the same. So Spinoza, before that, reading Aquinas, he's just so rigorous. When you realize as an undergraduate that he's going to question everything he wants to say a couple of times before he finally says it, everything in the world and the cosmos. I mean, it's bonkers, but he's brilliant. And at the end of that to say, you know, it's all straw and dust or whatever it was he said, to approach it with a humility is great. And I think still Plato, the truth is, if I go back and I can read him forever and it never ceases to be wonderful. And that links maybe to my less glamorous hero. I did my PhD on Gadamer, hans Georg Gadamer, who is Heidegger's pupil. He's seen as the boring one. And in some ways, he was the boring one. Jeremy Corrette at Kent once said, Gadamer's your Gandalf, isn't he? And I was like, oh my God, you're right. He's my Gandalf. He kind of has a gandalf vibe. And partly because Gadamer is, was so deeply committed to going back through history and getting the insights of everybody. You don't leave anyone. You keep the best of what everyone had to give, and you bind it together. Gadamer also was a Platonist in a way that Heidegger wasn't. He was very influenced by Plato and saw him as a positive influence. So I think he taught me a lot. I ought to cite an Indian thinker. The other person I did my PhD on was Rupa Goswami, who is an early modern Indian philosopher, and he's wonderful for a range of reasons to do with partly sincerity and an engagement with what is vibrant and wonderful in life. So maybe all those guys are my Avengers. Brilliant. Another classic question we like to ask our guests is whether they've changed their minds on any significant philosophical position throughout their lives. So a few examples here, again, that listeners will be well aware of by this point. Uh, Eugene Nagasawa told us that he converted to theism from atheism through the ontological argument. Rutger Bregman the other way around, theism to atheism through the work of Bertrand Russell. And Sam Coleman from agnosticism to pantheism through his work with the last John Templeton project we worked with, which was pantheism and panentheism project. Have there been any big shifts like these in your own thinking, Jessica? I was always fairly oriented towards, let's call them monistic models of being, right, in the many, many forms that they take. So that hasn't changed, that stayed steady. Although if you know the Indian stuff, I moved away from Advaita, Shankara's Advaita, where the world is illusion, toward what's called Beda Beda, which is a more realistic monism. It's a more kind of substance monism. But I guess if there was a real shift, I remember the moment when I accepted that actually something more like Dennett's model of the self was right. He wrote a book called Freedom mm-hmm. Evolves. And at the time, those debates about free will and selfhood were very strong. And I read that and I suddenly thought, yeah, I can see how extreme complexity plus emergence gives you what is, in a sense, the equivalent of all the things we want to secure in the self, including free will to all intents and purposes, still comes out the same and is explained well within this model and other things as well. So that was one. And maybe just also in the second year of my PhD, when I'd been reading a lot of Heidegger, there's a moment when you're reading Heidegger when you're like, oh my God, maybe the world doesn't exist. Ah! And I <laughs> sitting at the top of the philosophy faculty in Cambridge, staring at the tree in the courtyard. And I was like, is it there? Is it not there? Is it just me? You know, everyone has that solipsism moment. And then just something clicked. And I saw what it would mean to think of everything as, in some sense, being and consciousness. How the whole structure of self and other and the fear of solipsism dissolve if you take an even more radical approach. So I think my ontology changed as a result of a particularly extreme interpretation of Heidegger kicking in at some point. Brilliant. No, that's fascinating. We're going to touch on theories of self and ontology and so on later in the interview. You've changed your mind on so many things there. It's going to be hard to break that into a small soundbite <laughs> example in the future. But something that doesn't change are how bad my segues are into part one. Part one, fundamental reality. So Jessica, this is the first time we focus an episode specifically on Hinduism. Therefore, it's probably the best that we begin by saying what Hinduism is. Although Hinduism is the third largest religion in the world, many of us in the West know very little about the tradition. So an easy question for us to start here, what is Hinduism? 
Hinduism is not any one particular doctrine, creed, or tradition. It's a mix of traditions that came out of the Indian subcontinent. So it contains a range of different views on almost everything, including fundamental reality. And that's part of what makes it interesting. It's more like thinking of ancient Greece with all the different pre-Socratics and the Platonist and the Aristotelian views bundled together into a rich, complex tradition. So that's part of the answer. It's complex, but it has a shared, coherent conversation that's unfolded for 3,000 years, which gives it a profound integrity in terms of the discussions it has about important issues. What most people know about Hinduism is that it has lots of gods. It has a kind of pantheistic, quote unquote, way of thinking. That's generally true for, certainly for the very mainstream tradition of Vedanta, that there is an overarching assumption that there's one underlying fundamental reality called Brahman, which in fact all the gods really are just manifestations of this. So it does have a kind of central belief, but there's a lot of variation. Within the Hindu tradition, you get atheists, you get atomists, you get a huge range of stuff within there. And we're going to touch on all these topics, and that's fantastic. But we're just kind of curious. So if Hinduism is this system that has some shared beliefs, but ultimately is incredibly diverse, how is it possible for us as scholars to speak and think meaningfully about it if you can be atheistic and believe in many gods at the same time? Exactly the same as you speak about any other tradition. I mean, people who have a difficulty speaking about that are people who shouldn't be doing Western philosophy. What a bizarre thing in a philosophy faculty to simply call it philosophy, see it as quote unquote a Western tradition, even though it spreads extremely wide, and contains diametrically opposed views. And the same is true for Chinese philosophy, for many others as well. Is this the right way to think about it then? So rather than thinking of Hinduism like Schopenhauer's philosophy, right? We think of Hinduism like English philosophy or European philosophy, which has loads of those different views. Is that the best way to put it? Yeah, I think that is a helpful analogy. Even Buddhist philosophy, which in some ways is a more narrow focused tradition that has a specific Mm -hmm. critical point that it makes in a couple of different ways. Even Buddhism is very diverse and arguably is just proposing different metaphysics at certain points. And it itself is not sure whether it's proposing any metaphysic. So that I think that's right, to see Hinduism as a kind of a a whole tradition, a whole multifaceted cultural tradition in itself is helpful. So touching on those metaphysics then, a good place to start is probably the creation story or account itself, which we find in the Vedas, the oldest scriptures of Hinduism, and it's the hymn of creation. And I'll give the first verse of that here. Then even non-existence was not there, nor existence. There was no air then, nor the space beyond it. What covered it? Where was it? In whose keeping? Was there then cosmic fluid in the depths unfathomed? So this is obviously very beautiful, and I love those verses that you give in your books and cite in your works, and how they question rather than just like assert. It's so nice to read something which is Socratic in a way, if that's not simplifying it. Here's the question. Think what you will of it. Here's some suggestions rather than premise one, premise two. So it's beautiful to read in that way. But also, there's a problem here, right? As we found in our Eastern philosophy series, is this is really confusing. How is it that before anything there was existence and non-existence, and they both exist or don't exist simultaneously? In other words, give a simple question then. It's not a simple question, it's a really difficult question. Before the universe came into being, was there a cosmic fluid? In some ways, think of it as a philosophical text rather than a specific doctrine. That's what's interesting about this text. There are others that I work on that give an answer. This is what it was. This is how it unfolded. This text, which is one of the earliest, the Nasa Diyasub, as you said, the hymn of creation, it's the one that starts by saying philosophically, how would you know? It's actually starting with a kind of a metaphysical and epistemological question. So when it says, in the beginning, there was neither existence nor non-existence, was there primeval waters? It probably is referring directly to the very common ancient Near Eastern myth that there were just some big empty waters and then the world came out of that. This is a myth that you find referenced in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible. It's a myth referenced in Egyptian thought and many parts of Greek thought as well. You know, in the beginning, it's just a big watery thing. And that, in a sense, is often seen as itself non-existence. It's nothing in particular. Or I think even in the West, we have this question, it's a big black space. What was there before the Big Bang? I don't know, a big dark space of nothing much. And I think the text is already saying, but wait a second, what would that even be? 
Does it have time-space conditions? What substance is there? If no substance is there, is nothingness a thing that you can just have by itself? Because, of course, when we think of that intuitively, we think of a dark space, but that's not nothingness. So it's really asking what we even mean by that. That's a really interesting way to put it. So when I was reading your text and familiarizing myself with Hindu creation, it seems that, so on the one hand, we've got the Abrahamic faith that God creates the world out of nothing, ex nihilo, but the Hindu it seems to suggest that it's out of something, ex deo, as you were suggesting there. Is that the right way to phrase it? For the Hindu, they believe there's always been something. And for the Christian, the Jew or the Muslim, they think that there, at one point, if that makes sense, was nothing. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, that particular hymn, the Nasadiya Sukta, doesn't answer in that way. It just leaves the question and says, even the gods wouldn't necessarily know. It's really just critiquing the simple assumption you can come up with the creation myth. But the versions that then developed go exactly where you're saying ex nihilo is just not an option because it seems ridiculous. It's absurd. What does it mean to make something out of nothing? Empirically, we have no precedent for that idea. Not much anyway, depending on how you think about what it is to make. So nihilo just wasn't really an option. So whatever is the one, what there is must have emerged from it. It is a material cause by definition. And I think you're right that ex deo, even whether or not that's God exactly, but ex primeval thingy, that must be for them how it works. And I think a lot of Hindu metaphysics flows from that place. And so what do you think the Hindu would say in response to that classic Western Christian white male thinker who says, okay, you're missing the point of creation, they say. They might be a proponent of the Kalam or Leibnizian cosmological argument and say, you can't say there was always something because everything that exists requires a cause. You need to explain how that something came about in the first place. And so just saying there is always something, it doesn't answer the question, why is there something or how did that something come about? How would you think the Hindu would respond to that? The elephant in the room in these debates usually is the issue of what it is that could be self-existent and causally effective in making things be, but just self-existent. So the Kalam philosopher says, oh no, that's okay. There is a thing at the beginning. It's God. He doesn't need to be explained because he's self-existent. Almost all of the thinkers you can point to ask that question, they'll say, yeah, but there is obviously something which is already there. It's the self-existent thing. And you know, that's again, in a sense, Spinoza's definition of substance and why he defines substance as divine is because whatever it is at the beginning has to have this character. It has what they call aseity. It just intrinsically is. So that's almost always there. There are very few metaphysics, I think probably ever, that simply say there was absolutely nothing and suddenly there was all this stuff. End of story, right? Physics doesn't really say that either. Physics is still trying to figure out how to think about what it means for there to have been whatever it is that creates the conditions for the world we know. So I think what the Hindus are doing is pointing to this underlying question of what is the self-existent thing. And in terms of creation ex nihilo, I think even Aquinas is uncomfortable about the idea that in his model, when God creates the world, he simply makes a new thing that completely autonomously is a separate thing. Because for Aquinas, whatever God has created is still actually ontologically dependent on God. At that level of the divine being, God is always still upholding everything else. So actually, India is saying something very similar to what almost everyone else in that tradition would want to say. And just maybe the difference is that often what will happen is the West will say, yeah, if you're in that view, God does continuously uphold the existence of the world. And if he disappeared, the world would disappear. So the world is constantly grounded in the divine being, but it's not a material cause. And in some ways, that goes back to a Western discomfort with materiality a kind of an almost Gnostic discomfort with that. Whereas India says, oh, I don't know, material causation, we shouldn't be so uncomfortable about that idea for complex reasons. Let us pause for a moment to say a quick thank you to the selfless good karma of Westall Endowment, the Global Philosophy of Religion Project, and all of our loyal, enlightened patrons for banishing ignorance over at patreon.com forward slash panpsychast. In particular, a very special thank you to the man travelling through ashrams in India, practising yoga with hippies, it's Mr. Adam Cool. He pities the fool who practises ahimsa but doesn't harm them with erratic gunfire, it's Mr. T. He's not an avatar of Lord Vishnu, he's a very naughty boy, it's the life of Brian Ramirez. 
Stuck in a never-ending loop of life, death and rebirth, round and round, samsara she goes, it's Miss Lily Hooper. The patron saint of Ganesh, he is wise, lucky and guides the way, it's Saint David Ligeness. Holding his breath as he plunges into the river Ganges on pilgrimage, it's Jamie Lung. Crashing his car as he stares at the Diwali fireworks, it's Jay Wheelless. And the man whose name is more unknowable than the origins of the Indus River Valley civilization, it's Moron Vanderkolk. If you're enjoying the show, then please head over to patreon.com forward slash pansycast to show your support. A link is also in the iTunes description. Right, let's jump back into it. So in the Upanishads, Jessica, we find a number of useful descriptions of God, or the word that Hindus use for this is Brahman. In one story, a boy called Shadakadu is struggling to understand Brahman, so his dad pours some salt into the boy's glass of water and gives it a stir. The boy is confused, wondering why his dad has ruined a perfectly good, normal glass of water. And once the salt was dissolved, the father explains, Brahman, or the spirit of the whole universe, is like an invisible and subtle essence. From this description, should we understand Brahman to be identical with the universe? And if so, is this a form of pantheism? so the belief that the world and God are identical, or panentheism, that the universe is there and there's this other worldly part of it as well. The bit you quote from the Chandogya Upanishad is a wonderful story and quite widespread one. That Upanishad, which is an ancient text from around something like 800, 700 BCE, and it has lots of metaphors, lots of images of the world being divine or coming from God or being suffused with God. I was once walking in an old cemetery in Washington, D.C., and one of the gravestones had a quote, I am but a wave, and soon I will return to the ocean. And it's another metaphor from that Upanishad, actually, right? So it's a very common Hindu model of some kind of substance flowing back into or dispersing through another substance. Is it pantheism or panentheism? Well, the history of those words is complicated, but pantheism when it was rejected, was usually rejected because it seemed to reduce God to merely the world and the sum of its stuff. And I think Hinduism doesn't do that. One of the things that defines Brahman, the divine, is that it's the constantly generative, intrinsically generative root. So the same Upanishad, the Chandogya, uses also the image of a tree. It's the thing that when you cut down the trunk, the tree will grow back again. And that's, in a way, the difference, I guess. It's not just the trunk is God, the root, which will keep making and is there under the ground at all times, for them is effectively the divine, is being itself per se. So maybe that's panentheism. Those words are complicated. As with all religious traditions, then, there's a branch of Hinduism called mysticism, and this is in other religions as well. This particular branch in Hinduism may say that we can't attain knowledge of Brahman's nature. So a good example of this might be the story of the blind men and the elephant, right? So lots of blind men around an elephant, someone touches its tail and it's like, ah, it's a rope. Someone touches its tusk and they're like, ah, it's a spear, but they don't see the full big picture. Do you think this view of Brahman is a reasonable one? There isn't a simple statement of the view is exactly that, right? So there are maybe two different approaches to interpreting the notion that you can't simply get a grasp of Brahman, the one ultimate reality the fundamental reality under all things. One is that it simply is so diverse in its manifestations. Imagine you're talking about just being. How do you characterize being? Is it red? Is it blue? Is it in the past or in the future? It's all of these things, including all the contradictory qualities. Another analogy that's quite nice is a crystal. A crystal is red and yellow and blue partly depending on which direction you look at it from, but it's also clear. It's some intrinsically multi-manifesting thing. So that's one approach is that there are good reasons why you might want to say certain kinds of things are hard to comprehend in their totality. You're always going to perceive things perspectively. You also get more extreme mystical group associated with Maya and their view of Maya or illusion, who say that the real ultimate root, we can see the tree, we can't see the root. What the root is, what the crystal is, which of course is transparent, in itself rather than in its manifestations, it just is hard to grasp. And that goes back to classic the Western divine being philosophy. God is simple. What an extraordinary idea, the doctrine of divine simplicity, a very bizarre one, that God is one pure nature in which all properties and being and essence and existence are all united into one almost inconceivable kind of being. So the West also is kind of unclear about what it would mean to understand either the divine in itself, if you're in a philosophy of religion tradition, 
or even being in itself. More generally, what that means is very much up for grabs. Back to creation. For the Abrahamic believer, C.S. Lewis, for example, thinks that why did God create the world? Well, he wanted something to love. And Christians might think, oh, God created the world for us to enjoy it. Or God created the world so he could test us to see whether we're really worth hanging out with at the end of times. But why does Brahman create the world, if that makes sense? Because it seems to me like this is more of, again, looking at it through my Western lens, a uh, little learning is a dangerous thing. We've just finished a Schopenhauer series. So I'm thinking of the Brahman like this will, which isn't conscious of itself, like meta-conscious. It just kind of strives to be and manifests itself in the world. And so I'm thinking of Brahman like this. So it doesn't really have a reason for why it brings the world to be. It just kind of does it. What's the best way, do you think, to frame a Brahman and its intentions, if that even makes sense? That's a good question. For those who see Brahman as itself the fundamental reality root, the answer always has to be that there's some kind of intrinsic disposition. It couldn't be because of something outside itself. It has to be that there's some internal character of it, that it's innately dynamic and creative. It's like a powers ontology. The powers have to already be there. They can't be created by circumstance or by external response because it's the one reality. How to interpret that specifically in the Hindu traditions? One shouldn't automatically think of Brahman as a religious philosophy. I think it's complicated. In some ways, you can just treat it as a concept of being. And there are at least three ways of seeing it. One could be Brahman as a kind of substance. What is it that's intrinsically creative in that substance? There's a notion called Sat Karyavada in India, used across a range of traditions, which basically means the idea that whatever changes a thing goes through must always be intrinsically in potentio existing in the original source. So on that model, Brahman already always contained in potentio all the emerging different beings, characters, qualities that it becomes. It has to already be in there. A second way to look at Brahman is as a kind of, as you say, more like will or energy. What would a will be or what would an energy be if it just sits there? One of the metaphors that was used for this is fire. Fire is intrinsically dynamic, intrinsically complex. And so if Brahman is less like clay and more like fire, if being is less like clay and more like fire, it's going to create. And just the third model would be if Brahman is consciousness, so you get a kind of an idealist interpretation. So what if being is essentially consciousness? And then that debate goes into issues about could consciousness not be full of content, perceptions, movements of thought, experience, etc.? And the argument there is that, again, there must be something intrinsic to the nature of consciousness that it would expand into movement, content, understanding and form. So it's always, in a sense, an intrinsic disposition to create. That's fascinating to hear those interpretations. It's making it a lot clearer in my mind. I was thinking of the concept of Rito with that principle of natural order, which regulates the universe for the Hindu. Is that an intrinsic property of Brahman as well? So we look at the world, it seems like the laws of nature are fine-tuned for existence. So if they're a little bit off, we'd be floating around in space or whatever, not breathing, not having this conversation. We all know how it goes. Is Rita, that principle of balance or order in the universe, is that an intrinsic property of Brahman? Well, I think they would read almost backwards empirically and say, look, and this is actually one of the arguments that Hindus use against Buddhists, for instance. They'd say, look, we see order. And exactly that argument is used that if there was an order somehow embedded, you would become a banana, you'd, then you'd be a monkey, and then you'd be the color red, and then you'd be the number three, and then you'd be all flowers, and then you'd be Spain. But instead of that, there is coherent and continuous order, just empirically evident. And so I think that would show that whatever is the source, again, if there is one source, if you're on a monistic track, whatever is the source has to somehow contain at least the template for the emergence of that order. So in that sense, you would say whatever the order is, if it's Rita, if it's a different model, it's there. And maybe that goes back to a Western model as well, that this issue comes up. Could God have created without there being an order, a logical order, a numerical order, a conceptual order, and a physical order? But if there wasn't, what would you have created? Again, you'd have created a dynamic chaos in which monkeys become Spain, etc. It would have to be there for it to work that way. All of these views, all the monisms, played against a radically opposed monism called Advaita, very popular and very influential and very important, that said that Brahman itself doesn't really create the universe. 
that famously in Schopenhauer and many others were fascinated by this, they said that the universe is just an illusion. It's something we perceive and project onto an actually undifferentiated and unchanging reality. So that school was really fascinated. Everyone found it exciting. They've been hugely influential. And they're trying to preserve the purity and immutability of the ultimate foundation. But everyone, including their other schools of monism, found this problematic in terms of explaining creation. So you've said that Brahman can be being, it could be consciousness. Does that mean that this consciousness or this being designs and creates and sustains itself? You used the analogy earlier of a tree root that continually grows. Is it growing itself? <laughs> yeah. I think is the short answer to that. I mean, for the Vedanta school, which is the dominant school of monism, or for the one of the other monistic schools called Kashmiri Shaivism, who are more explicitly idealistic, we've got multiple monisms, they would all say that whatever the source is, it's not creating, it's becoming. And in fact, the word for creation in Sanskrit that's often used is srishti, which comes from the Sanskrit root srish to flow. The divine flows into existence. It's not an artifact metaphor. It's a flowing transformation, transmutation metaphor. So a couple of things here. I wonder if you could have some kind of ontological arguments to try to link and bridge that gap between contemporary philosophy of religion and these Western traditions, whether you could say, hey, what's the greatest metaphysically possible being? Well, it's everything. It's this self-existing thing that has always existed, that will always exist, and that encompasses the whole universe. And it has these properties like consciousness and self-existence. So I wonder if that's something there. But then this seems to go against what I previously understood to be a Hindu conception of Brahman, in which they say Brahman is something which is immutable, something that's unchanging. So on the one hand, we've got it's better to change than not change, or might go the other way around, we're not sure. Hindu texts seem to suggest that Brahman is immutable, but you're telling Ollie there that they'd say it's like this tree or this flow, which a tree that is growing is changing. Is there a tension there between Hindus saying that Brahman is immutable, but it's obvious that things change in the world and Brahman is the world? Yeah, that's the biggest debate in Vedanta, really. That's the biggest debate in Indian monism is whether it's changing or whether it's immutable. And that's the difference between these two schools. I just mentioned that on the one hand, there's an Advaita, which literally means non-dual Vedanta. And by non-dual, they mean there is no internal differentiation. It's a single, pure, immutable, eternal reality. So for them, it's exactly as you say. They want to preserve that purity, as it were, of the divine being. The other side says it changes. And there are specific metaphors and images they use to fight both sides of that divide. How could you possibly defend the view that it isn't changing? How could you say that Brahman is immutable? I lift my hand in the air and it disproves the theory, doesn't it? Yeah, well, that's the problem, right? So, and I want to be careful because Advaita is incredibly important and powerful and actually very beautifully expressed philosophy that many, many, many Hindus believe today. But philosophically, Advaita Vedanta was criticized by everybody for exactly this reason. Even other Hindus, even other monists said, look, it sounds beautiful that it should be non-dually pure, simple, unchanging, self-existent being, uncompromised in any way. And this idea is motivated by some of the same things that are motivating West to develop a doctrine of divine simplicity. Whatever is divided seems to have less integrity. It seems dependent on its parts. The parts seem more basic, in fact. So you can see a clear reason why you would want to reject partite being or changing being. But people kept saying, but okay, Advaita, if you hold that, then you can't take Brahman as the source of the world. As you say, every time I move, it moves. So they divided it. And that's why they say that the world we perceive is mere illusion. It's totally separate. But then the Buddhist and the other schools said, well, then how did that even come to exist? And Advaita said, oh, I don't know. It always existed. And eventually people said, then Brahman really isn't the creator. You haven't explained the world at all. So there was a big fight about that. So to the casual listener, they're probably thinking, these guys are talking a lot, but they haven't mentioned any Hindu gods yet. Surely Hinduism is a religion with lots of different gods. So we're going to talk about the different gods now. We're going to talk about the Trimurti. So it consists of Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the preserver, and Shiva, the destroyer. And these three deities are understood to be working in unison to create, preserve, and destroy the universe. How would you describe the moral character of these deities, Jessica? Is Vishnu good because he preserves the world? And is Shiva bad because he destroys it? I'm going to back up in a way and just say that the Trimurti already is a very much a kind of like a fabricated simplification. In fact, very few people in India worship Brahma. 
the goddess is actually the third most popular deity, and she's perhaps equally popular and maybe more than the others. So there's a huge range of gods and goddesses, importantly, and each of them has their own very widespread worship, often worship together. The question's an interesting one is the character of the gods. In some ways, what's different between Hindu polytheism and, say, Greek or other, let's say, ancient Near Eastern polytheisms, is that the Hindu version does get philosophized. There's a scholastic tradition that interprets these deities and ultimately says a little bit, as the West does to say, the divine understood as a personality is one manifestation, but underneath this is a reality that's defined as being, as consciousness, they say, and often as bliss and other things. So these deities are not separate individual things so much as manifestations of an underlying reality. And I think even though if you go to a Hindu temple, you'll see all the deities and you'll worship them all as very separate. There's Vishnu, he's kingly, he helps sustain the order of the world. There's Shiva, he's about transcendence, he's an ascetic, he's about transcending the world. There's the goddess, etc. I think even in practice, most Hindus, when you look into the eyes of the deity and you revere the deity, you're revering it as the ultimate foundation of reality itself. I'm pleased you mentioned the goddess there, Jessica, because in the Abrahamic faith, God is often referred to with masculine pronouns, and within Christianity, God literally incarnates into the male body of Jesus Christ. On a surface level, Hinduism seems fully accepting of goddess worship and the divine female as a legitimate part of Brahman. Does Hinduism have a more progressive gender view towards the divine in comparison to its Western counterparts? Towards the divine? Yeah, I think it does have a fairly enlightened conception of the divine in terms of gender. If you take any manifestation or any personality of divine being as just a mask of God, as I think Joseph Campbell put it, if you take it as a way of seeing, as a form the divine could take, but not the whole picture, then you can have so many. You know, the West says, oh, it's a patriarchal image that you get again and again of a beardy guy as the father God. And India says, well, if we're going to go there, we're going to start putting masks on this ultimate reality. We can have anything you want. So you do get goddesses. And personally, I think the Hindu goddesses are great. There's a tendency to assume that a goddess is going to be like a fluffy earth mother and flowing clothes, being nurturing. I've had experiences wandering through the Himalayas by myself in the mountains somewhere, miles up, and suddenly you think, is this okay? Should I be wandering around alone up here? And then you see a little shrine to Durga, who's a warrior goddess, a queenly warrior goddess, riding a lion, killing a buffalo demon, holding a sword with her flowing hair and her red sari. She's just an absolute rock star. And you think, oh, this is a really cool way of thinking about the feminine, if you like. You also get nurturing goddesses like Lakshmi. You also get a goddess who's all about intellect and culture. What a great association. Saraswati. So it's much more pluralistic in all of its manifestations, including gendered ones. I love that reflection there. And it, it reminds me of an interview I listened with you and a former colleague at Kent of yours uh, when you're reflecting on the purpose and value of travel. And it's nice to hear you speak there of this knowledge of Hinduism can enrich your experience of traveling, particularly around the East. And when I was listening to some of your thoughts on this the other day, I was reflecting on the time when I was in Thailand or India and thinking, I didn't understand so many of the statues and some of the worship which was going on. Your reflection of like Vishnu being outside all of the police stations in Thailand because he's the god of order. I was like, right, that makes sense now. I would have enjoyed that way more. Although Vishnu's the god of order, Vishnu comes to the world essentially to enjoy it. He wants to party and do earthly things that he can't do as a god. He comes to the earth to enjoy the world. In contrast, Jesus comes to the world literally to die on a cross to sacrifice himself. Does this tell us anything about the motivations of Brahman compared to the motivations of God the Father and the Abrahamic faith? And second of all, do you think this tells us something about is Hinduism just a more optimistic worldview than Christianity? Oh, I don't want to say yes, because that makes the other cultures sound pessimistic. But I think there's something really positive about a culture that just sees everything as intrinsically divine. That's important for the Vedantic tradition. Everything is made out of, ongoingly, sustainingly, constantly grounded in and made out of the ultimate being, which is the self-existent, trans-temporal, infinitely creative root of everything. Right. So you're already there. On top of that, it's not really the case that there's any notion of original sin. And so you don't have to make up for anything bad. Matter isn't bad. Bodies aren't intrinsically bad. India has a ritual purity belief, which is common across many cultures, where you have to be careful about the messy bits of the body. 
India has a deep concern with suffering. Buddhism mm-hmm. takes that to a greater extreme. It doesn't have original sin, but there's a natural suffering that goes along with being in the world. But even that maybe is worth noting that where Buddhism focuses on suffering as the great motivator of human existence, Hinduism says, yeah, it's a problem. If you don't like suffering, here are ways to get away from it, including yogic meditation. But maybe you do like suffering. (laughs) Maybe you have a reason why you think it's worth it. Maybe you want to have kids and you're like, it's going to hurt, but I'll do it. Love is a huge discourse, even at the moral, ethical, almost metaphysical level in Hinduism. The idea that love involves suffering, but the suffering itself is almost transmuted into something that's part of a higher order. Hinduism has all kinds of reasons why it sees the world as intrinsically good and full of good possibilities. So in the Hindu text, a wise man is asked how many deities there are in Hinduism, and he replies, quote, three and three hundred and three and three thousand. Not exactly the most straightforward answer to that question. How should we understand this? Rather than straightforward polytheism, like we've mentioned before, polytheism, the belief in many different deities, could Hinduism be considered a form of polymorphic monotheism, which allows for many distinct manifestations of a single god or Brahman? A, philosophically, yes. I think in a way, one of the best ways to pass the actual position being taken is something like a polymorphic monism. And for some Hindus, a polymorphic monotheism, right? So for a lot of Hindus, you do focus on the notion of God as a particular person, as Vishnu, as Krishna, as Shiva, etc. And I think philosophically, that's right. On the ground, the monotheistic part may come out more. There's an interesting bit in the Bhagavad Gita where God is giving a teaching about the nature of reality to his friend Arjuna. So it's the avatar. It's a bit as if Peter says to Jesus, hey man, can you just come over here and chat with me and explain about the whole nature of all reality, please? (laughs) And then, because you must know this stuff. And also, by the way, could you show me your intrinsic divine nature in its very core? And Jesus is like, sure, no problem. Let's do that. That's what the Bhagavad Gita is. And there's a scene where the friend Arjuna says, Krishna, can you show me your divine reality as the fundamental reality, source, sustainer, nature of all things? It's a sustainer and creator. You're constantly emitting beings and taking them back in when they end. So that goes to your point about creator and destroyer. Krishna says, sure, no problem, man, and reveals his true form in what's called the Vishwarupa, the all forms manifestation, where he shows himself as literally all the deities, all the beings in existence, all the beings that have ever existed in the past, all the ones to come in all worlds, all forms constantly emerging and being reabsorbed, basically. And in that sense, you've got this, as you said, polymorphic monism with a monotheistic face present there. Part of what's interesting from the perspective of practice is Arjuna says, oh, that's amazing. It's actually kind of scary. Could you stop now? Can you go back to being just this guy who I can see in space and time, my mate Krishna, you know, the incarnation? It always reminds me of the idea that the Greek gods, that Jupiter or Zeus will take a lover and the lover will say, oh, show me your divine being. He's going to be even more exciting and sexy than you. And Zeus says, this is going to be a bad idea. When he does in the Greek myths, invariably, the mortal gets burnt to ashes in a second because she can't take it, right? So that sense that it's actually more amenable (laughs) in a way for people to personalize, to concretize, maybe to anthropomorphize something that's much, much bigger is just a psychological fact in a way. We all must have been following our dharma because it's time for Mystery Philosopher. The Mystery Philosopher. So you're going to hear the voice of a mystery philosopher from the East, from the past. They've obviously been reincarnated, not into the body of their choice, and their vocal box isn't exactly clear. Let's see if you can guess who this mystery philosopher is. There is no crime greater than having too many desires. There is no disaster greater than not being content. There is no misfortune greater than being covetous, hence in being content. One will always have enough. (laughs) That was fabulous. I'm going to go with Siddhartha. Siddhartha, maybe? It's not Siddhartha. I mean, it could be almost anyone in Indian history. It's very, it's actually very (laughs) Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, but it could be someone like Vivekananda or one of the later expositors of that philosophy. You're both overestimating my knowledge of Eastern philosophy. It's Lao Tzu from the Tao Te Ching of all of them. But I was looking at so many of them and they've all got that rhythm and I was like, can't have that one. Be like water, that's too obvious. And that maybe that (laughs) one was a little bit too just taken out of the center there. 
That's great. It brings out the stoic side. Everybody's like, hey, man, just relax, take it easy. The solution is not to want too much. So very mm-hmm. un-Marxist in a way. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for this installment of the Pan Psychast. Tune in next week where we'll continue our conversation with Jessica. We'll be talking about death, evil, and suffering. But I promise you it'll be a little bit more cheery than it sounds. It's already available on Patreon, so head over there before the public release. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sai Cast. The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the Pan Sai Cast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Pan The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at The Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That's that was that great. Was that was really good. Great. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, it was good. Wow. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Great. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're yeah. doing a wonderful thing with this. <laughs>